As I sort of intimated at the uh, very start of today, uh, one of the things that keeps people trained in economics in a job, uh, speaking to what we've just heard about, is that there is no end to the fight against economically illiteracy and stupidity, basically. And just when you think that you've managed to win some argument conclusively and decisively so that nobody in their right mind uh, could possibly disagree with certain things, you discover that, no, it ain't so, uh, and fallacies that you thought had long since been put to bed have suddenly reared their head again. Uh, and one of the areas where I'm afraid this is true, as I intimated this morning, is trade. Uh, now, in that connection, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce the next speaker, Professor Don Boudreau from George Mason University in Virginia. I've known Don for many years. We first met at a seminar uh, when we were both much younger, I think it's fair to say, back in the 1980s at Belmont uh, in California, uh, just south of San Francisco. And over the years, uh, it's been a pleasure to hear him uh, talk on many occasions. And I know that although he's interested in many things, the topic of trade and the economics of trade is one of his great passions. Uh, and uh, he sees it as one of his roles to, in fact, slay the dragons of economic illiteracy on this issue in particular. Uh, and so that's indeed what he's now going to speak to you about now. So uh, thank you very much, Don. Thank, thanks, Steve. I, so when we met, I must have been about 10 years old, yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a special pleasure for me to talk about trade in Great Britain, because Great Britain is truly the uh, ideological and practical home of free trade, and it's a topic about which I feel uh, very, very passionately. Uh, I'll um, fly back home on Tuesday, July 4th, and I tell my students and I'm sincere about this, I tell my students that the importance of 1776, they think the most important thing is that we got rid of the shackles of Great Britain. I tell them the most important event of 1776 is that that is the year in which Adam Smith published an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations, which is a great treatise on free trade. They look at me as if I'm nuts. Um, so uh, I have 15 minutes to summarize uh, and make the strongest possible case for free trade, and then you can pepper me with questions. So the basic uh, case is, is this, right? This guy wants a rock, this guy wants a stick, he has a rock, he has a stick, and so they can trade. But of course, trade is more than just transferring one item from where it's less value to where it's more value. It's that, it's, it's much more than that. You, you should think of trade as a technology. Trade is a means of allowing us to achieve our ends at a lower cost. And when we achieve our ends at a lower cost, we can achieve more ends. We can grow richer, grow materially wealth wealthier. And that doesn't just mean more luxury goods. It means more food, more, medical, more medicine, more, more uh, uh, education. Uh, no one thinks that I have a lawn in Virginia. And no one thinks it's, it would be improper for me to uh, choose the best way to mow my lawn. I can mow it with scissors. I really could. Right? Or I could mow it with a lawnmower. Right? Well, I choose to mow it with a lawnmower. Actually, I choose to have my son mow it with a lawnmower. But <laughs> I, I choose to mow it with a lawnmower because I can get the same job done at a lot lower cost. No one thinks twice about my making that decision. Uh, but, but suppose instead I choose to buy a lawnmower from a Japanese company rather than from an American-made company. Now people get all upset. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm choosing a bad method of achieving an end. Trade is a way to allow me to achieve that end at a lower cost. The reason I buy the Japanese-made lawnmower is because it allows me to mow my lawn at a lower cost, and hence I can achieve other ends. The uh, economist, David Friedman, uh, conducted this mental experiment. He said, suppose some genius invented a machine, a big machine, and this machine, and it had some switches on it, and this machine it worked this way. Uh, you put it in a, in a, in a, in a country, uh, and you, you, you take vegetable matter from that country, vegetable matter that's pretty abundant in that country, and you just shove the vegetable matter into the machine. And then you wait a little while, and then out at the other end, the machine converts the vegetable matter into automobiles, into lawnmowers, into MP3 players, into uh, contact lenses, into all sorts of things that are useful for consumers. If someone invented that machine, that person would be heralded. They'd win 
if there's a Nobel Prize in wonderful machines, that person would win it. Uh, of course, there is no such real machine, but in a way, th there is. So in America, this is a picture of a cornfield in Iowa. We grow a lot of corn in Iowa. <laughs> and, and so the way Americans make cars is we grow corn, and we put it in a machine, and then we get cars back. But the machine is not really that. The machine is a cargo ship. We take the corn, we put it on a ship, the ship goes across the ocean, the ship comes back filled with automobiles and other goods and services that we like. There's no difference in using a machine to better produce something than using trade. Trade is a technology. This is, some of this was touched on in the previous discussion. Now, having said all that, I know the big fears about trade, so let me very quickly try to dispel some, at least, explain why economists believe these fears are unjustified. These are US data, but they actually you can look at other, other market-oriented countries and they apply. Um, the yellow line is US civilian employment, the number of people working in the civilian uh, labor force full time. The green line is the size of the US civilian labor force. It's from 1950 until today. In 1950, there were just over 60,000 people in the US workforce and just about that many working. The difference between those two lines is the unemployment rate. Over the past almost 70 years, the US labor force, civilian labor force, has gone up by about 150%. The number of jobs in the US economy has gone up about 150%. I show this to you, this graph to you first, to dispel the notion that there is a fixed number of jobs, that if trade destroys jobs in the lumber industry or in the textile industry, that that represents a, or that, that entails a permanent reduction in the number of jobs in the economy. It doesn't. The number of jobs in the economy is not fixed. I'm trying to figure out where I should point this thing. Here we go. Uh, this is uh, the same yellow line that is US civilian employment from 1950. The green line is real US imports, it doesn't, as opposed to fake US imports. It means US imports in value adjusted for inflation. Well, they've gone up. There's no discernible impact as, in, as imports have increased into the US. There's no discernible impact on the number of jobs. Jobs kept going up right along with it. One of the most uh, convincing findings, one of the most secure findings of economic science and of the empirical studies in, e in economics, despite some recent claims to the contrary, is that the number of jobs uh, is not affected by trade. Trade doesn't affect the number of jobs. Trade shifts where jobs are. Um, this uh, shows worker productivity and real total compensation from 1947 in the US until uh, 2015. And this shows another strongly, uh, strong economic relationship. Wages or total pay, pay and wages and fringe benefits, are determined by worker productivity. Worker productivity rises, worker pay rises along with it. Trade allows worker productivity to increase because what trade does is shift workers in each country from industries in which they have a comparative disadvantage, as the great English economist David Ricardo pointed out almost exactly 200 years ago, to industries in which they have a comparative advantage. That means Trade shifts workers from where they are less productive to where they are more productive. That's one of the contributing factors to increasing wages. Um, oh, mm -hmm. So people worry about the trade deficit. The current occupant of the White House uh, worries about the trade deficit, especially. He's not unusual in that. He's just vo especially vocal about that. But what people don't understand when they worry about the trade deficit is that the trade deficit is simply another name for a capital account surplus. The trade I, I wish this international accounting artifact was never invented. Unfortunately, it is invented. It has been invented, so we have to deal with it. Uh, when countries trade, there are basically two things that uh, can be done in that trade. The people of the different countries can exchange imports and exports, or they can invest in each other's countries. When they buy or sell imports and exports, that is recorded in something called the current account. And when a country imports more than it exports, that country has a trade deficit. It sounds bad. Deficit sounds bad. Uh, but 
when a country imports more than it exports, that means that the rest of the world is investing in that country more than that country is investing in other parts of the world. It means a trade deficit does. That, uh, the, that people in other countries find the country with the trade deficit to be especially attractive as a source and destination for investment. You can tell stories about why this might be bad, but they're very, very uh, strained stories. Um, the late economist Bill Niskanen uh, did some economic, back in 1991, he did some historical research and gathered data going back to 1607. That's the year of the first permanent English settlement in what is now the United States of Jamestown. Uh, the data gathering wasn't quite as good in the early 17th century, but you can reconstruct things. And what Niskanen found is that uh, uh, English North America ran a trade deficit every single year from 1607 until, anyone want to guess? 1914. And from 1914 until 1977, sometimes we ran trade deficits, sometimes we ran trade surpluses, and from 1977 until today, the United States has consistently run a trade deficit. And so for only a very, very small portion of U.S. history uh, have has the U.S. run trade surpluses. We've mostly run trade deficits. The United States is a relatively attractive destination for investment. That investment enables a country to grow. This is a graph. The bottom line is a trade deficit. The top line is the amount of capital being invested by foreigners in the United States. And you can see they're virtually mirror, mirror images of each other. Um, this, again, is that, that yellow line is U.S. civilian employment. I've showed you that before. From 1950 through uh, 2015, the green line is the U.S. trade deficit from 1950 until today. Again, you see, I hope you can see it, I hope it's vivid enough, you can see no effect of the increasing trade deficit, the increasing trade deficit here depicted by a, that, that, that green line going further and further south. You can see no effect of an increase in U.S. trade deficit on U.S. civilian employment. They're contrary to the narrative that's constantly uh, uttered, at least in the U.S., I can't say for sure in Great Britain, but contrary to the, the incessant narrative that the trade deficit is somehow a drag on jobs or a drag on economic growth. Here we have evidence that's quite strong against it. Um, I have only a few minutes. Let me jump to my final point. I think the biggest, if, if I have to single out, the single biggest argument for free trade is that it is a source of peace. There's a lot of economic research in this, actually. Uh, the two, probably the two most well-known researchers are the American economist Solomon Polachek and Carlos Sigley. Uh, and a very famous paper they wrote uh, just over 10 years ago looked at, the, the, use fancy language, you have to use fancy language to be a professional economist these days, dyadic trade relationships, bilateral trade relationships between two, two different countries. And they had measures of how openly any two pairs of countries trade with each other. And then they looked at the likelihood of those, any of those two pairs of countries going to war with each other. And they found very strong statistical evidence that the more open is trade, the less likely will war break out between those two countries. Not that it won't for sure break out, but trade reduces the likelihood of hostilities breaking out. I, tell my I ask my students how likely it is that the Canadians are going to invade America. It just seems bizarre because uh, Canadians are America's biggest trading partner. And it's just a good rule of business. Don't kill your customers. <laughs> or, or, or your suppliers. Let me end this with, I started noting how Great Britain is truly the home of free trade, practically and theoretically. And in addition to Adam Smith, uh, one of the greatest free traders was Richard Cobden. This is a picture of uh, his statue in Manchester. Uh, I didn't take it, although I've seen the statue. And uh, uh, Cobden, as you probably know, was a leader of the free trade movement in Britain in the mid-19th century. He, along with John Bright, were responsible for the repeal of the, of the Corn Laws, which was the first major step that Britain took toward achieving uh, virtually unilateral free trade by 1860. 
I just love this quotation. Free trade, this is a, a, from a speech he gave in uh, Covent Garden in 1843. Free trade, what is it? Why, breaking down the barriers that separate nations, those barriers behind which nestle the feelings of pride, revenge, hatred, and jealousy, which every now and then burst their bounds and deluge whole countries with blood. Those feelings which nourish the poison of war and conquest, which assert that without conquest we can have no trade, which foster that lust for conquest and dominion, which sends forth your warrior chiefs to scatter devastation through other lands, and then calls them back that they may be enthroned securely in your passions, but only to harass and oppress you at home. It's very flowery, very eloquent language, but I think history proves Cobden to be right. The more open is trade, the more peaceful people will be to each other, and that is the single greatest justification for free trade. Thank you.